When analyzing how much value markets create for society, we often talk about the terms consumer surplus and producer surplus. And we know conceptually what those terms mean. Consumer surplus is the value created for consumers above and beyond the price that they pay for an item. And producer surplus is the value created for producers when they receive compensation or price for what they're selling above and beyond the marginal cost that it costs to produce. But it's also helpful to be able to incorporate these concepts into our supply and demand diagrams. So let's think about how to identify consumer surplus and producer surplus graphically. Luckily, we can always use three simple rules to identify consumer surplus on a supply and demand diagram. Consumer surplus is the area that's one, below the demand curve. Two, above the price that the consumer pays for the item. And three, to the left of the equilibrium quantity or the quantity that's actually transacted in a market. So we have three examples here. We can think about how to apply these three rules and always get a correct calculation or identification of consumer surplus. So this first one over here is just our typical free market diagram. We don't have any price controls. We don't have any regulation. All we have here is regular supply and demand. So let's think about our rules. We say that consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve, above the price that the consumer pays. Well, in this instance, there's only one price, and that price is the same for both the consumer and the producer. And to the left of the equilibrium quantity transacted. So we would see in this situation that our consumer surplus is this triangle here. Now you notice that because this is a triangle, this third rule about to the left of the equilibrium quantity seemed a little bit redundant, but that's not always going to be the case, so it's, it's important to keep that rule in mind. So let's look at another example here. Here we have a tax. Now again, our three rules. Our consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve, and notice we've just drawn our tax wedge diagram here. So what we have is just our regular demand curve for the consumer. So below the demand curve, above the price that the consumer pays, so in this case we mean the price inclusive of the tax because that's the price that's relevant for the consumer. So we're going to be looking at this price here as the relevant price. And to the left of the quantity transacted, which is going to be this Q star sub T when we have this tax in place. So here, our consumer surplus is this area here. Again, it's a triangle. So this third rule was sort of obvious or redundant, but now let's look at a case where that's not true. So here we have a price ceiling. So we put a price ceiling in place, and this is a binding price ceiling. It actually affects our market. We can still use our rules. So we're looking for consumer surplus to be the area below the demand curve, above the price that the consumer pays. Again, with the price ceiling, we only have one price because the consumer and the producer have that both are subject to that same price. But now, because of this price ceiling, our equilibrium quantity, we have to think about how many units are actually being transacted, because obviously we can't get surplus on units that are not bought and sold. And we say when we have a price ceiling in place, supply becomes a limiting factor, so our relevant quantity transacted is here. Well now, unlike before, if we were to think about these three boundaries, we could extend this up, and we could see that our boundaries give us not a triangle, but a trapezoid. Nonetheless, our rules still hold, and we know that this area here is in fact our consumer surplus. So again, just a couple of reminders about some common pitfalls in calculating consumer surplus. One is that it's really important to identify the price that's specifically relevant for the consumer because there's no guarantee that there's only going to be one relevant price in a market, that sometimes we have a price that's relevant for the consumer and then a price that's relevant for the producer. Second, the quantity that's transacted in a market is not necessarily the same as the quantity demanded at a particular price. So you can look here 
And it seems like because we're talking about consumer surplus, we want to be thinking about this quantity demanded, except it takes both a buyer and a seller to make a transaction, and consumers can only get consumer surplus on units that are actually bought and sold. So here, even though this would be the quantity demanded at this price, that's not what's relevant, because all these consumers who are subject to this shortage are left with nothing and therefore not getting any surplus. Similarly, we have three simple rules for identifying producer surplus on a graph. And those three rules actually pretty much take the same structure as those we had for consumer surplus. So the rules for producer surplus is that we have to find the area one above the supply curve, or if we wanted to think about this in a slightly different way, above the marginal cost curve, depending on context. Two, below the price that's relevant for the producer and three, to the left of the equilibrium quantity, or the quantity transacted in a market. So those sound pretty analogous to the rules for consumer surplus, so let's think about how to apply them here. Again, first we have the simple case of our basic supply and demand diagram with our free market. And we can say, all right, we've got to find the area above the supply curve, below the price that's relevant for the producer, and here we just have one equilibrium price, so it becomes a non-issue. And to the left of the equilibrium quantity transacted. So it seems pretty clear here that our producer surplus is just this triangle. And again, that third rule about to the left of the equilibrium quantity seems a little bit redundant, because again, the first two defined a triangle, and then the third one didn't really add anything. But that's not always going to be the case. So let's come over to our second example, which, as we said, represents a tax on a market. We have our tax wedge, we have our new equilibrium quantity, and so on and so forth. So again, our producer surplus is the area above the supply curve. And notice how this is really easy to do with our wedge diagram, because we haven't actually moved either the supply curve or the demand curve. So above the supply curve, below the price that's relevant for the producer, so now it's this price here, because that's the price that the producer gets to keep when a tax is placed on a market, and to the left of the quantity transacted in that market. So again, we have a triangle that renders that last rule sort of obsolete, but nonetheless, producer surplus is here. And last but not least, I cheated a little bit here, because I wanted to give you an example that wasn't a triangle. So what we had before is a price ceiling I now have as a price floor. So you notice I moved this around a little bit, and now it says PF. And we can use our rules above the price, below the demand curve, to the left of the equilibrium quantity, to see that our consumer surplus for a price floor would have in fact been here. And we can also label with our price floor that the lesser of the quantity demanded, or the quantity supplied at that price, when a price floor is binding, is going to be our equilibrium quantity. So we can use our rules to identify producer surplus on this graph. And we could say, all right, above the supply curve, below the price that's relevant for the producer. Well, again, with the price floor, it's just going to be the same price that's relevant for the consumer and the producer. So above this guy, below this guy, and to the left of the quantity transacted in the market, which we said was this here, because the distance between the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied at this price is just a surplus. It's not actually items that are getting bought and sold, and producers can't make, sur can't make surplus on items that they don't actually buy or sell. So we have producer surplus. So it looks like this here, and we could label this. Now, as I was talking, I said, oh, actually, we have one potential source of confusion in that we're using the word surplus in two different contexts, right? So we could talk about a surplus meaning literally extra stuff that's left over in a market when, for example, we have a price floor. Or we could talk about surplus as the value created for consumers or producers in a market. And those are two obviously different concepts, and you want to treat them as different but it should be obvious from context which one it is you're talking about. 
And notice here now that we have our example of that case where our surplus is not going to be a triangle. So all three rules do in fact become relevant. And we have one, two, and three. Again, we can recap some common pitfalls when calculating producer surplus. The first one, of course, to be you need to make sure that you're finding the price that's relevant specifically for the producer. You know, that might in some cases be the same price that's relevant for the consumer, but not always. So you want to make sure that you're looking below the correct price. And two, coming back to this issue here, producer surplus is not necessarily gotten on all of the units that are being produced. That we're only getting producer surplus on units if they're actually being sold. So we need to look and make sure that we're calculating producer surplus as compared to the quantity that's actually being bought and sold in the market, which might not be the same as the quantity supplied by producers in that market. In the case specifically of this price floor, whether the producer surplus is this trapezoid here or this entire triangle is actually going to depend on whether or not the government or a third party actually buys up all the surplus at this price. But if we're just leaving the price floor to itself and saying, well, you're just gonna sell what you can sell to consumers and then you're done, producer surplus is gonna look like this here.